Well, welcome to another work day uh, for Farming Thomas Community Orchard. We're really happy you're here. Um, some familiar faces from other work days, and this is a much mellower one. Less grunt work today, more education. We've been really excited to get into our educational role as a nonprofit, and we've been building and building capacity to do all of the educational work, and now we're really excited to finally get to host something that's got the educational component we've been working towards. So Sarah's a good friend of mine and a super knowledgeable bee lady and wonderful farm hand helper. She works for the USCA and I'm so happy she was willing to come do this with me. Um, today is all about pollination. So we have the garden club here. You know, we, we got a nice grant from them to purchase the pollination trees for the orchard. So we have four crab apples with two different blooming times to stagger the pollination because we have such a mix of variety and such a mix of bloom times that we really needed to make sure our pollination was on point. And then around that, we're going to be build, building a understory pollinator planting that will just bring pollinators of all sorts to the orchard and hopefully bring some beneficial insects as well. Pollination is important, but we need those beneficial insects for attacking our pests for, for nesting and, and building their own population to help keep the orchard more holistic and having to do less work. If the, if the bugs are here that we need here, our allies, these sorts of plantings and, and days, they really encourage that. And so if we want this orchard to function holistically and as organically as we can, the insects and all the things that we're going to try and foster in it are going to do the work for us if we can get the orchard to the point of having a stable population of beneficial insects. So that's the pollinators and that's also the little pollinating the wasps and then the things that will then attack the pests. So today is all about pollination and if you have questions throughout the day Sarah and I will be bouncing around but right now we're going to talk about native bees. Yeah yeah so mostly um, you know over there you can see the honeybees um, they're given you know, most of the spotlight in the media. Um, you know, they're great for big numbers. They're more of the quantity side. You know, you can get a hive shipped over and put them on agricultural land and they do a service. Um, but I'm here today to kind of focus on a few of my favorite other bees um, that are native. So yeah, if you didn't know, honeybees are not native. They brought them over um, and manage them. So they're kind of like a domesticated animal in a sense, um, but they have their use. Um, but uh, one of my favorites is the bumblebee. Um, they, they are, you know, they're special in a way. So honeybees are generalists. Um, they kind of just go out and pick up pollen when they can. Um, bumblebees are special. They can grip onto certain pollen sacks on a flower and sonicate it, which will actually release the pollen. So things in the nightshade family like tomatoes, potatoes, and eggplant cannot be pollinated without bumblebees. So people actually have commercialized bumblebees as well and you can buy a box of them, but without that sonicating release, then it's released for the point, then the honeybee can come along and, and aid in that. So tomatoes and bumblebees are best friends. Um, yeah, so bumblebees are cool. They, they overwinter, they nest in tree line. Um, they're very, you know, charismatic. You see them everywhere, um, especially this time of year, the queens are out. So, as, you know, the azaleas and the rhododendrons and all that, you can see them out and about for another week or two. Um, they're pretty great. Um, but then we have more of the bees that don't get a lot of the shine in the media and in general knowledge of people is the uh, leafcutter bees and the mason bees. They're solitary bees. Um, they're cavity nesting. So they find, you know, um, stems and, uh, you know, sometimes they do in the ground, but mostly I'm going to talk about today is the, are the ones that do the nesting in these cavities here. So it, it, it's a great way to kind of feel like you're giving bees a habitat because honeybees, you know, you kind of need the expertise and the suit and bumblebees do their own thing. They, they don't like being given a home. They choose it for themselves in old mouse holes in the forest. So having a tree line is great for them, but mostly bumblebees are given, you know, the resources through our pollinator plants. But with mason bees, um, they're actually, I'm going to talk about leafcutter bees first because mason bees are kind of the star of the show today because they're called ma orchard mason bees. Um, but leafcutter bees, they got the furry bottom and they use leaf material to stuff it in 
to here. So if you guys pick up one of these, you can see the great pictures here of them stuffing it in. Um, they're more of a single mother, so they bring the pollen in. They have a little larvae. They also have great um, cross section. You can see the tube because you can't see it here when it fills in, but um, they'll bring the pollen and, and the nectar in. They just make enough honey for themselves um, and bring it in. And actually, uh, you know, they they'll store it in sections and then over the, you know, they'll overwinter and emerge the next spring. So that's great. And uh, mason bees are cool because they use mud. So they, um, they'll bring it in. And I, I, I like to show off these. So I made this one this morning um, because it's like slapped together bamboo. Everybody hates bamboo, but it has its use. <laughs> so if you dry it out and the pithy part kind of falls out here, and if you cut it at the nodes in the back, so each, you know, if you look at a, uh, what's it called, uh, you know, the tubes here, and the, each node, if you cut it here, they like one end saw, uh, sealed, so that way they can build up from that section here. So, and they like a specific diameter too. So what's interesting is different diameters they'll choose for their nesting, so different species, like different uh, size holes, which is really cool. So I made this one five years ago for my mom um, and brought it to her. But this, as you can see over time, it's just a block with drilled holes in it at a specific, you can get a drill bit that kind of drills in. And then, uh, you know, every year you can see it fill up and you, so how to set these up. I, I'm sorry if my talk's a little all over the place, but um, what you do is uh, you had, these have to face Southeast for the best sun in the morning. And eye level is the best, or on a tree, maybe behind a bush or something like that. So they love um, filling in these by, it's good to have them in by end of March, April, um, so that they have the time to fill it in. Um, and then this one I got Abishan, which is cool. This is more of the tube method. So, you know, you got these tubes here. Um, a little bit cheaper of a method and overall this, this one's cool too but um, this one you can keep filling them in with in replace it if it gets kind of dirty um, and then they have the back here so that they can fill it in all the way um, but yeah the uh, mason bees are great because with um, they say that one mason bee can do the job of a hundred honeybees um, they are much more efficient so when you think about native pollinators they're here in this habitat, they're established here, so they fit the specialist plants a lot better, just like I said about the bumblebees and the tomatoes. Um, so you got quantity versus quality, you know? So you have the, the native bees that kind of do all the nitty gritty little things, and the honeybees, I think, are just spreading it all around to help overall. Um, so yeah, the orchard mason bee is a, is a great one. It's blue, you'll see this great figure that we printed out from Michigan State University. Um, they have a great handout here, um, all the different bees. Um, so you can see them coming in and out and feeding their young and getting them ready for the season. So it's really great. And if we put, um, I've, I've made bee hotels in large capacity. Sometimes they're humongous. So you can have this type of blocks in there with the reeds as well, side by side. Um, even the wasps sometimes take advantage of the little nesting areas, spiders get in there. So you're kind of creating this little community in your garden and it's really easy to do. I love showing kids these because it's easy to do. You can put this in a can too, and you know, as a backing to hold it up and uh, just make sure it's in the right spot in your yard. And, and this, this hand also has the direction step-by-step step to be able to help the orchard mason bees in your area and leaf cutter bees. So yeah, I like to, to, you know, educate people about our native bees because we, tend to look past them when we see the honeybees and the bumblebees doing their thing. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. This one. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually a block. It comes out. And the, I think it's solid in there because of old cobwebs and stuff. So this is five years old. We put like a you don't want to use cedar or anything like that. You, we use a pine block, but it, so you know, the block is as deep as the house. yeah. So it actually come there. I, there's a spider in there, so I was oh. like, mm. oh yeah, okay. Yep, there's like spider nest, but that's fine. You can clear that out every season. This is just kind of an, uh, it's you know, it's older, <laughs> it's weathered, but it's fared well. I'm proud of it because I made we, you know, I made these, and I was like, oh wow, it's still good. It's still hanging. It's got them, you know, little hanger. 
She put it on her fence right behind the Forsythia. Oh, oh yeah, they loved it. So, um, and pollinator plants, you know, in general, we're going to touch on that at the end is, you know, everything with perennials are great because they come back year to year and you can kind of put these in a spot next to perennial plants and, and your animals, of course. But. What's the relationship between the honeybees and the native bees? Are we, by introducing honeybees, kind of um, taking away fodder for the natives? Yeah, so that is a big debate in bee. Can you uh, repeat the question so I can Yeah, so honeybees, do they create a problem for the native bees? Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, they they have been known to bring in um, disease. Um, they you know I, I study bee parasites that were kind of transferred over. There's nosema. Some bees can get it, some can't. But um, yeah, it can cause problems and put pressure on the native populations. Yeah, um, but it's good I think to just they're not going anywhere. Bees are like a beloved thing. We got our wax, we got our honey. Like it's not anything that we're willing to give up. So I think we just have to work to be aware of who else is around and include them in our little garden parties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, bumblebees. Um, so the later flowering plants are really great for the um, queens and the mating males that are trying to overwinter. So bumblebees uh, go into diapause, so they overwinter. And so they're really trying to stock up on their fat stores and get under leaf litter and, and go into hibernation. So they are all over everything that's available at that time. Like sedum's one of my favorite stone crop because they, I just see them all over. I'm like, yay. <laughs> so, yeah. The life cycle. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, sections of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leave, blow it into a corner. Um, it's great for your soil too. Um, all those microorganisms and all those different things, you know, being covered. It, you know, having it bare, as you know, isn't good. <laughs> it looks nice, neater, but for the plant purposes um, and for the bees, it's great. Yeah. Are there plans for these or like? So I was going to donate this one. It's kind of ironic. It's a honeycomb for a native bee, but that's the market for, you know, getting people into it. This is from Abishan. I was going to donate it to the orchard here to, um, you know, get that going. And it might be a little late, but some of the orchard bees will still, they'll do a second round um, and try to, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and try to uh, put an, you know, if they fill up one of their holes somewhere else, they'll come back here, so. Will different species of bees cohabit? <coughs> they can, yeah. This is, you know, when you have one size hole, you'll most likely see one type. Um, but when we make bigger hotels, we'll put different sizes, different reeds, different thicknesses. Um, this is just the generic, like, bit size. And, and all that information, specific sizes are in here, if you're curious. Yeah. Yeah. Bumblebees are, so are the orchard bees and leaf cutter bees. They're out really early, which is why you need these out in April. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they continue all the way into what? Yep. Off, yep. Or? Yep. And then the, the mothers of these will, um, use, they usually don't last another season, and then their offspring will emerge in that early spring again to cycle back yeah. through. Can you tell us a little bit more about how sonication works? Sonication is really cool. Like yes. Yeah, so they grip it with their teeth. Um, and they buzz at a certain frequency. So they have tuning, you know, some people use tuning forks. When I worked in a pollinator lab, we would hit them with tuning forks at a specific frequency and that would release it. Um, or we use sonicating toothbrushes to release it. It just, it's, uh, if you have a specific frequency on the tuning fork, it's a lot more um, efficient. But yeah, it's really cool how they know how to release it. And you can hear them too, like bite and buzz. It's really cool. So honeybees kind of just land and go. So, but they're doing their service too. So, there is a there's a book called uh, Bumblebee Economics. If you really want to know about the science of it, mm -hmm. the guy studied it. Talks all about the vibration of the thorax and how they vibrate. Like that. But it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's a good book. So that sound that you hear under like a mm. cherry tree that's just yep. so loud. Yep. That noise isn't. That noise is a 
Yeah, pollination. Yeah, it really releases that pollen from the anthers. Mm -hmm. And nightshade fam, like I said, potatoes, tomatoes, everyone knows tomatoes in their garden, home gardens. Um, that is essential. You can't have without it. So some, some places will actually release them themselves, which is way more labor intensive than having a bumblebee do it. <laughs> So. But with pollinators dying, yes. that is our reality, right? So right. that is like why we need to be doing these pollinator talks and talking about pollinators. Yeah. And, and you know, honeybee bees, they're the reason they are, you know, they get moved. Like when it's yes. time for the almonds to be pollinated, those can be picked up and moved. And so they have their place in our food system. Yes. They, they do, I mean, like without almond. the pollinator, mm -hmm. we wouldn't get to eat, right? That's the fruit. Um, so yeah. thinking about large scale agriculture and thinking about bumblebees and their use there, it's, it's important mm -hmm. that they're there for a lot of our food crops, but in a native community, like right. these pollinators are the heavy hitters. And so right. we really wanted to make sure y'all were aware of them and how to encourage them in your own yard Right. and to plant. So mm -hmm. talking about your tomatoes, your nightshades, um, mason bees, what are they super into? So you said, I mean. Yeah, I mean, we could go days with yeah. what they like, but, um, you know, uh, I would say just if you have tomatoes, put, you know, other plants next to it, other flowering plants that'll attract um, bees to that area. So they do hedgerows in a lot of agricultural systems to put just plants to attract pollinators. So that's cool. Yeah. A lot of those hedge plants is what we'll be incorporating into the second row of the orchard. So if you haven't been here before to hear about the orchard, one side is com completely for commercial use. All the trees are really tight together, they're on that trellis line and they're going to be pruned in a very specific way, meant for high production. But the, the other orchard row is spaced that semi-dwarf spacing, so they're, they have much more space in between them and in between those trees, until they're mature and shading, there's a lot of growing space around them. So while those trees are maturing, we have all that access to that space, we're going to use it and we're going to put in these pollinator plants and other fun little fruits and bushes and harvestable things and edibles. But pollination is going to be a big part of what we're kind of trying to put in in those spaces to really bring the pollinators to the trees because we want a good fruit set and, and it's going to take us bringing them here to get them where we want them. So. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions for our 